Well, we've had, we've had some spirited debates in the last couple of days around price and wage setting in advanced economies. Central banks talk too much to markets. Who killed the Phillips curve? I think the feeling was there were potential culprits in this room. Maybe we can have a polling question on who killed it. Uh, but now we get to hear from a group of, of four individuals who collectively probably have more capacity to actually change price and wage setting in advanced economies than anybody else, maybe even more than Donald Trump, perhaps. Uh, we have, it seems kind of crazy introducing them, but anyway, we have VC President uh, Mario Draghi, uh, Federal Reserve uh, Chairman Powell, uh, Governor Philip Lowe from the Reserve Bank of Australia, and Governor Kuroda uh, from the Bank of Japan. Um, now, those of you who are familiar with this panel in the past, their task their tough challenge is to say something reasonably interesting to all of you, but not at all interesting to anyone listening outside. Um, and you'll be able to judge maybe at the end how much they've, they've pulled that off. Um, we're going to have brief, I hope, um, relatively informal remarks from each of them at the beginning. I get to ask a few questions, and then I promise you will get to ask lots of erudite questions as well. But President Draghi, do you want to kick us off? Well, thank you, Stephanie. I think you set the bar pretty high in saying, asking us, asking me at least, to say something interesting. But uh, just uh, trying to um, get the sense of many of our discussions today, but also last year, um, the first question is, um, uh, there is clearly, well, the first, the first point is, is there is clearly a variety of reasons why uh, the response of inflation and wages has been so slow. And uh, they go from measurement of the slack, low productivity, the trade unions have disappeared, uh, structural reforms, labor supply has gone up, it's increased a lot, and then non-wage related aspects like people wanting more stability rather than higher wages, especially because their employment is of low quality, and then the importance of past inflation. Now, to disentangle all these reasons, it's very difficult. But one conclusion is that we see that all these, the combined effect of all these reasons is gradually washing out, is gradually waning. Uh, the, a good example is uh, one given by the importance of past low inflation for a long time. Uh, the ECB staff uh, calculated that uh, low inflation, past low inflation has dragged about 0.2% out of wage growth in the last uh, three years, per year, 0.2% per year. And now we see that this effect is waning out, and as, it, as headline inflation is picking up, headline infl current headline inflation becomes more and more important, and past low inflation is losing importance. And so that, that's, in a sense, also says that in anchoring inflation expectations uh, was crucial and remains crucial, and fortunately they were well anchored. So uh, once this is said, uh, we see that nominal wages are indeed increasing. Uh, no matter which measure we take, we take uh, cons compensation per employee, we take compensation per hour, we take negotiated wages, all of them are going up. And they're going up around now, it's 1.9%, the last data point for, uh, for, the, uh, for the compensation per employee. And compensation per hour is the same, about the same thing. Well, having said that, um, is this going to be translated into higher inflation? Well, here, I think the record is a little more mixed. For example, we had, uh, we had an increase in wage growth by 0.8% between 2016 and 2018 and this year, but the increase in inflation was only 0.1%, and because productivity had gone up by 0.7%. Um, now, what do we expect for productivity? We do expect it will grow less than it has done in the late stage of the cycles, and wages, nominal wages, will grow more than they have done in the, in the, in up to now. So all in all, we see the union labor costs on, on an upward path, and, uh, uh, and by the way, the other consideration which was touched in the previous discussion was related to pricing power, the coming back of pricing power. Uh, and there, 
again, we see encouraging signs because if we look at an index which more closely reflects uh, input prices, namely the domestic price, domestic non-food price inflation, in April that's gone up by 0.5%, which is the highest rate since I think the last six, seven years. So all in all, uh, this uh, is, um, is encouraging. Now, what about e-commerce? Is this going to dampen this process of recovery in inflation? Uh, and again, the previous discussion about whether uh, an increase in concentration does affect the rate of inflation, uh, to some extent, uh, gives some light, some light on, on this issue. Now, the answer that we have is that we find uh, very little evidence that uh, e-commerce e has any effect on, on inflation. Uh, it's uh, clearly it has increased price transparency, clear may have some compression of margins, uh, some cost saving, but all in all in the aggregate, this doesn't show into uh, a, a, a permanent lower inflation. So probably the effects of the e-commerce and other aspects of globalization have to do more with the composition of, of industries rather than with an aggregate effect that we, we, don't, we cannot find in the data, an aggregate permanent effect. So all this makes us uh, confident that uh, inflation is converging towards our objective and we draw this confidence by the tighter, the ever tight labor market, uh, by the high capacity utilization rates by, and frankly, by, and as I will say in a moment, by the continuing ample monetary accommodation, uh, also by the uh, disappearance of what uh, uh, we uh, call the tail risk of deflation. So all this uh, leads us, as led the Governing Council last week, to uh, give guidance on monetary policy. And uh, the first thing is we made, uh, as I said last week at the press conference, we need to make sure that the ample degree of accommodation that is currently incorporated into the financing conditions on which the staff projections are predicated is maintained for as long as necessary in order to bring about the convergence of inflation towards our objective. And then we went through the various measures. We said that we intend to maintain our portfolio of accumulated securities for an extended period of time after the end of net purchases, and in any event, as long as necessary. So, and then we enhanced our guidance on future rate path for our key interest rates. We said that we expect to help them at the present level at least through the summer of 2019, in any case, for as long as necessary to ensure that inflation evolves along a trajectory that is aligned with the sustained adjustment path that we expect to see in the medium term. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you. Chairman Powell. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Mario. So nine years into an expansion that has sometimes proceeded slowly, the U.S. economy is now performing very well. Growth is meaningfully above most estimates of its long-term trend, although uh, admittedly that trend is not what we would have hoped it to be. The labor market is particularly robust with uh, unemployment at, at its lowest level since April 2000, and inflation has moved up close to our 2% objective, although we haven't yet seen it uh, remain there on a sustained basis, as our goal would suggest we should do. <clears throat> Today, most Americans who want jobs can find them, and high demand for workers should support wage growth and labor force participation the latter a measure on which the United States now lags most other advanced economies. A tight labor market may also lead businesses to invest more in technology and training, which should support productivity growth. And some groups, such as some uh, racial and ethnic minorities that still have higher unemployment and lower participation rates, could also see increasing benefits from a tight labor market. In short, there's a lot to like about low unemployment. Achieving our statutory goal, though, of maximum employment in a context of price stability and financial stability is both our responsibility and our challenge. Earlier in the expansion, as the economy recovered, the need for highly accommodative monetary policy was clear, but with unemployment low and expected to decline, to decline further, inflation close to our objective and the risks to the outlook balanced, the case for continued gradual increases in the federal funds rate is strong. I'll turn for a minute to uh, current labor market conditions. 
At 3.8 percent, uh, the unemployment rate is now below most estimates of its long-run level, which are clustered in the mid-fours. And many other labor market indicators also suggest an economy near full employment. And I'll, I'll name just a couple. Um, uh, one would be an elevated level of job vacancies. So for the first time since the labor market began collecting this data in 2000, there are now more job vacancies than there are people counting, counted as unemployed. In addition, uh, the quits rate is, uh, is elevated, a sign that workers are able to find another job when they seek one. And surveys show that businesses are finding it difficult to fill vacancies and that households perceive jobs as plentiful. A couple of other indicators are, are less clear. Uh, labor force participation among prime age workers uh, has moved up in recent years but remains below its pre-crisis levels. In addition, wage growth has been moderate, which is consistent with low productivity growth, but also an indication that the labor market is not excessively tight. Looking out ahead, the job market seems likely to strengthen further. Real GDP is now reported to have grown two and three quarter percent over the past four quarters, well above estimates of its long run trend. Expansionary fiscal policy is uh, just arriving and expected to add to aggregate demand over the next few years. So many forecasters expect the unemployment rate to fall into the mid threes and to remain there for an extended period. If that does come to pass, it will mean the lowest unemployment in the United States since the late 1960s, 50 years ago. Uh, because we have so little experience with very low unemployment, it's interesting to compare today's labor market with that earlier period. Unemployment was below 4% from February 1966 through January 1970, and during that time, PCE inflation increased from below 2% in 1965 to about 5% in 1970. In hindsight, uh, unemployment is now widely thought to have been unsustainably low and to have contributed to escalating inflation. But the question is, how significant and relevant is that precedent for today? The U.S. economy has changed in many ways over the last 50 years. By some estimates, the natural rate of unemployment is substantially lower now. For example, the Congressional Budget Office now estimates that the natural rate was about five and three quarters percent then and now a full percentage point lower. And rising education levels do point to a decline in the natural rate since the 1960s because more highly educated people are less likely to be unemployed. The share of the population with a college degree has risen from less than 15 percent to nearly 40 percent now. And the share with less than a high school degree has declined from 45 percent to about 5 percent. Another important uh, difference from the 1960s is that inflation has been low and stable for an extended period, which has better anchored inflation expectations. Today, policymakers have a greater appreciation of the role expectations play in inflation dynamics and a clearer commitment to maintaining low and stable inflation. So unfortunately, with the passage of a half century and important changes in the structure of our economy and its central bank practices, in my view, the historical comparison does not shed as much light as we might have hoped. And that lack of useful historical precedent leaves us with some uncertainty about the answers to several important and challenging questions. First, uh, estimates of the natural rate of unemployment by FOMC participants and others have drifted lower as unemployment has declined without much apparent reaction from inflation. But how, how reliable are these current estimates? Uh, they've always been uncertain, and they may be even more so now as inflation has become less responsive to unemployment. The anchoring of, of expectations is a welcome development, has likely played a role in the flattening of the Phillips curve, but a flatter Phillips curve makes it harder to assess whether movements in inflation reflect the cyclical position of the economy or other influences. Second question, uh, what would be the consequences for, for inflation if employment were to run well below the natural rate for an extended period? <clears throat> The flat Phillips curve suggests that the implications for inflation might not be large, although a very tight labor market could lead to larger nonlinear effects. Research on that question is ambiguous, again, reflecting the limited historical experience. We should also remember that, remember that where inflation expectations are well anchored, it's likely because central banks have kept inflation under control. If central banks were instead to try to exploit the non-responsiveness of inflation to low unemployment, and push resource utilization significantly and persistently past sustainable levels, the public might begin to question whether our commitment to low inflation continues and expectations could come under upward pressure. Of course, so far we see no signs of this at all. If anything, some measures of longer term uh, inflation expectations in the United States have edged lower in recent years. Third question, can persistently strong economic conditions uh, pose financial stability risks? 
Of course, strong economic conditions are a good thing. Uh, such conditions can make the financial system better able to absorb shocks through strong balance sheets and investor confidence. But we've often seen confidence turn into overconfidence and lead to excessive borrowing and risk taking, leaving the financial system more vulnerable. Indeed, the fact that the two most recent US recessions stemmed principally from financial imbalances and not from high inflation highlights the importance of closely monitoring financial conditions. Today, I see US financial, vulnerability, financial stability vulnerabilities as in line with their long run averages. While some asset prices are high by historical standards, I don't see broad signs of excessive borrowing or leverage. In addition, banks have far greater levels of capital and liquidity than before the crisis. Fourth, while persistently strong economic conditions can pose risks to inflation and perhaps financial stability, we can also, also ask whether there may be lasting benefits. As I mentioned at the beginning, a tight labor market could draw more people into the labor force. In fact, as the labor market has tightened, more workers have been moving back to work and off disability roles. That could also, there could also be benefits to productivity and potential growth. All to told, though, the persistence of any such positive hysteresis benefits is uncertain, since, again, the historical evidence is sparse and inconclusive. So to wrap up, uh, as is often the case, in the current environment, significant uncertainty attends the process of monetary policy. So today, with the economy strong and risks to the outlook balanced, the case for continued gradual increases in the federal funds rate remains strong and is broadly supported among FOMC participants. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Philip Lowe. Thanks very much, Stephanie. It's a great honor for me to be able to participate in this panel. In some ways, I'm, I'm the odd one out here. I come from a small economy, not a larger one. <laughs> We've uh, had positive interest rates for the last decade. We haven't had to go anywhere near zero. We haven't done quantitative easing. We haven't embraced forward guidance. And we've had 27 years without a technical recession. I'm hoping we can extend that uh, a while longer. So, kind of, with, as I said, an odd one out. But I don't really feel like the odd one out, though, because the issues we're discussing here in Sintra are really the, at the core of the issues we're discussing in Sydney. In Australia, the inflation rate has been below the midpoint of our target for some years, and it's going to stay that way, I think. Wage growth has repeatedly surprised on the downside, and the current rate of wage growth isn't consistent with us achieving our inflation target on a sustained basis. So, like others, we're, we're grappling with why we find ourselves in this situation. The fact that it's happening in so many countries suggests to me that there are global factors at work and they're probably structural in nature. And the result of those factors is that the inflation process looks very different in many countries and at the heart of that, I think, is the wage process, which, which looks different. Whether that's going to be permanent, I, it's hard to tell, but it's certainly persistent enough that it's important for policy. So what I'd like to do in, in my time is to offer some reflections on two issues that are really at the heart of this conference, and that is why is the wage process different and how much of it's structural and what are the policy implications of that. So the wage process, as I said, is different. So the relationship between wages and unemployment looks to have changed. And there are three sets of factors that I think are really important here. One is the, the changes in the industrial relations landscape, and we saw a really good example of that this morning in Professor Schoenberg's paper. I think the evidence there is pretty compelling. Changes in industrial relations arrangements in Germany have affected wage and employment outcomes, and the Australian situation uh, experience is very similar to, to the German one. It's hard to escape the conclusion that changes in industrial relations has changed the inflation process. The second one, or the second factor, and I think this is actually more important, that the, there's increased perceptions of competition arising out of globalization and technology. Everyone uh, feels like there's more competition. And one of the first things you learn in economics is that there's more competition, prices aren't as high. We discussed this in the earlier session. And there are a couple of factors that are driving these this extra perceptions of competition. One is globalization. Uh, there's hundreds of millions of extra people have entered the global labor force, uh, particularly in China and India. And first of all, that affected manufacturing wages around the, around the world. And now I see it affecting services wages. Many more services sectors are becoming tradable. I see a lot of examples where business services that used to be supplied in Sydney are now supplied in Manila or Chengdu or Bangalore. And that's meaning that everyone feels like there's more competition. And the other factor that's adding to the sense of competition is, in, uh, is uh, the nature of technological progress. 
It's much more likely to be embedded in intellectual capital and physical capital. And we're also seeing widening gaps between the leading firms and the laggard firms. And both of those features are affecting the wage dynamics. With technology progressing so quickly, and particularly for the leading firms, many firms are having trouble keeping up. They're having trouble ado adopting the new technologies. And to remain competitive, they focus on what they can control, and that is their costs. And the main cost they can control is their labour costs. So that the technology progress is leading for many firms to have a very, very strong mindset on controlling costs. Again, I see lots of examples of this in Australia. Almost every business meeting I go to, business people complain that it's incredibly hard to find workers. And I rather naively ask, well, why don't you pay more? Attract some workers from another firm. And when I do that, they look at me as if I'm completely mad. That would be the last thing they would do. And I typically get a lecture about how competitive the world is. There's kind of competition from China, Japan, and uh, they worry about kind of technology. And kind of, so the last thing I can do is increase my cost. It's the one variable I can control. So there's this very strong mindset that I've got to control costs. And I think it's coming from competition. It's a global factor, and it's structural. The third factor that's affecting the relationship between wages and unemployment is that labour supply in many countries is turning out to be much more flexible. And we're seeing this in a rise in the participation rate. There are a variety of reasons for this. One is, uh, and we see this again in Australia, rising labour force participation by older people as health outcomes have improved. We've seen big advances in um, the health outcomes for many people. And uh, with us not, our bodies are lasting longer as we're working in services rather than manufacturing. And that's allowing people to stay in the labour force longer, particularly when there are jobs there. I think that's quite an important factor. And uh, the, the increasing acceptability of part-time employment is allowing uh, many women, particularly, to stay in the labour force longer. So the labour supply is turning out to be quite flexible. So even though we're seeing very strong employment growth in a lot of countries, it's not translating into higher wages. So things look different. Industrial relations, increased perceptions of competition, and increased labour supply. And I think those factors are going to be around for a long time. So I don't expect the situation that we're, we're dealing with to change quickly. So what are the policy implications of this? But the main one it, to me is that the system that we're operating in looks less inflation prone than it once was. And that's reflected in most of us worrying about inflation being too low, not too high. It's a, it's a very different world when, when I was at university. So listening to the discussion over the past two days, I, I've been trying to think about, we're trying to listen for ideas about how we deal with this world that is less inflation prone. And I can take the liberty of summarising the things I've heard under three, three broad kind of approaches one, one, one could adopt here. One is that central banks should just try harder. The basic conception of how the economy is working is, is, is fine. We just need lots of monetary stimulus. We need to keep at that. We, we need to just try harder and eventually it'll, it'll turn out uh, okay. The second perspective, a couple of people touched on this yesterday, is we just need to accept that inflation will be low for a while. After all, low inflation isn't that bad. Now, central banks want to achieve their inflation targets, so that's, that's clear. But most people out there in the communities that we're supposed to be serving don't really care that much if inflation's a bit lower than the target, especially if the labour market outcomes are okay, if there are plenty of jobs being created. So the second perspective is, well, it's, it's, not, it's not kind of fantastic, but we've just got to be patient, except that inflation's going to be a low for a while, and there's not really a great loss of social welfare from that. The third perspective was, uh, one introduced by Yuri yesterday, said, we'll just lift inflation expectations. Central banks should embrace social media. They should communicate better, make it very clear what inf inflation expectations should be, and the problem's kind of solved. I think you, you can make uh, a case for each of those perspectives, and I don't think there's a right answer. I see that a few problems, though, with the try harder approach. Just keep on solving this problem with monetary stimulus. So I don't see the risk return trade off from that approach being particularly attractive. Uh, in terms of return, the effectiveness of monetary stimulus in driving up inflation, kind of, I think there's a question mark over how effective that is. And I can see clear side effects, and the side effects come on the financial side. 
if interest rates are low and the economy is growing quite well, that's a great environment to borrow to buy assets. And we've seen some of that. So we see higher debt and higher asset prices. It's helpful now, but eventually interest rates will hopefully need to correct and some of that, uh, th those developments on the financial side will need to be uh, uh, reversed. And that, that's going to pose risks. So it, you know, the effectiveness of more monetary stimulus to solve the lack of inflation is questionable and I see clear risk from doing that. So I think that does leave us with the possibility of accepting that inflation might be just a bit lower than we'd like for a while. That's difficult for central banks to accept. So they see their job kind of deliver on the inflation target. But it's not so difficult to accept that if you see your job or your mandate as broader than just delivering on a specific rate of inflation. In Australia, our mandate was written back in 1959 and it hasn't changed since then. We haven't swung with the fashions in central banking. It's, we don't have a single mandate. We don't even have a dual mandate. We have a triple mandate. <laughs> That's price stability, full employment, and the general welfare of the Australian people. <laughs> That's an unfashionable mandate, perhaps, in this room. But I, I'm really glad that we have that mandate, especially in the current environment. And I use all three elements of that mandate when I'm explaining what we're doing and why we're doing it. I often ask rhetorically in publicly and to the politicians, do you think it would serve our collective welfare to have yet more monetary stimulus so that we could get back to inflation more quickly if the main way we got back to inflation more quickly was encouraging people to borrow more and push up asset prices even further? Now, not everyone's going to answer that question kind of the same way, but most people say, look, no, that's not worth it. Especially if the labour market's generating sufficient jobs, which is certainly the case last year, we've had 3% employment growth. So in our case, my view has been that the welfare maximising approach, which is really what we're, we're about, well, maximising the welfare of the people, is to be patient as long as the labour market is improving. As long as we're moving in the right direction, we don't need to force the process more quickly through monetary stimulus. One thing, though, that we have done in an effort to get there a bit more quickly is a version of option three, lifting expectations. As I said yesterday, it's lifting wage expectations. Uh, my concern has been that a 2% wage norm has become the standard in Australia and we're getting reasonable labour productivity growth. So 2% wage growth and reasonable labour productivity growth doesn't make for 2.5% inflation on a sustained basis. So I've been talking publicly quite a lot about trying to lift wage norms back to start with a 3 rather than a 2. Whether that works or not, I don't know, but I'd rather do that than try and deliver more monetary stimulus to get inflation rise. I'd try, rather do it by trying to lift wage ex expectations. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I can see everyone now preparing their resumes for applying <laughs> to be the head of the Reserve Bank of Australia. It's quite a nice <laughs> job. Uh, Governor Kuroda. Oh, thank you. Uh, Japan's economy has uh, improved significantly over the past five years since the introduction of quantitative and qualitative monetary easing, or QQE, in April 2013. The economy is uh, no longer in deflation, which is uh, defined as a sustained decline in prices. However, wages and prices have continued to show relatively weak development compared with a strong economic expansion. The mechanism behind this uh, phenomenon is not entirely clear. Today, uh, I would like to talk about the recent experience in Japan where uh, the sluggishness in wages and prices seems to be more evident uh, compared with other advanced economies and discuss its implications for the Bank of Japan's monetary policy. First is uh, firm's uh, wage setting stance. For the past, five, uh, for the past few years, uh, total cash earning per employee have been rising, albeit uh, fluctuations. Uh, however, their pace of increase has been moderate compared to the labor market tightening with the unemployment rate being at a 
record high, uh, record low level of 2.5 percent. In particular, base salaries of full-time employees, which account for almost 70 percent of total employee income, have not uh, risen much, uh, despite uh, general labor uh, uh, market tightening. In Japan, lifetime employment has been uh, widespread, and labor mobility across firms has been relatively low. Therefore, wages of full-time employees tend to reflect labor market conditions insufficiently, at least in the short run. In Japan, uh, wage negotiations between labor and management takes, uh, take place at uh, major firms every spring, where the rate of increase in base pay is decided. The rate has been almost 0% since around 2000 under the prolonged deflation. In 2014, when actual prices started to rise, there was a return to base pay increase for the first time in nearly 15 years. However, the problem is that the pace of increase in base pay still lacks strength. On this point, uh, some have argued that reflecting that both labor and management in Japan place priority, high priority on the stability of employment and wages, firms avoided large-scale layoffs and wage cuts during the prolonged uh, deflation uh, so that uh, firms cannot uh, simply switch to increasing wages even when the economy grows and the labor market conditions tighten. The deflationary mindset <coughs> that had become entrenched among people has been quite uh, tenacious, and it will take time to completely dispel this mindset. Second is farm's uh, price-setting uh, stance. Even though moderate wage increases have been taking place, Wage costs have not yet been directly passed on to prices of products and services. Firms that face increases in wage costs will generally consider the following two options to maintain the same level of profitability. One is to pass on the increased uh, uh, wage costs to uh, sales prices, and the other is to improve productivity through streamlining of business processes and labor-saving investment. So far, many firms in Japan have been making efforts to raise their productivity. The fundamental reason behind this is likely to be the tenacious deflationary mindset that I mentioned earlier. Consumers remain reluctant to accept the price rises despite the improvement in the employment and income situation. Therefore, firms are cautious about raising prices due to their concern over losing customers. Another likely reason is that the productivity of Japanese firms, mainly in the service sector, is low by international standards, and thus there is significant room for improvement. In fact, initiatives are widely being taken in the services and retail sectors, such as enhancing efficiency of customer services, cutting back excessive services, and optimizing inventory management and delivery services. Such efforts by firms in these sectors are encouraged in part by digital technology in recent years, including artificial intelligence and robotics. These measures to improve productivity are expected to produce positive effects in the long run in that they would address uh, structural issues such as a decline in the working age population and lead to boosting the growth potential of Japan's economy. At least in the short run, however, they likely will reduce the upward pressure on prices. I would now like to uh, make three points uh, from the perspective of monetary policy. First, wages and prices have been improving gradually under the powerful monetary easing over the past five years, although sluggishness remains. 
a base pay increase has taken hold again in Japan's economy, and proportion of firms that have raised their base pay, base pay has been increasing steadily. In addition, mainly in the service sector, where there is an acute uh, labor shortage, moves to reflect the increased wage costs in prices uh, have been uh, uh, spreading gradually as medium to long-term inflation expectations are projected to rise through the adaptive formation mechanism if further price rises come to be observed widely. The Bank of Japan judges that the momentum toward achieving the price stability target of 2% is firmly maintained. Second, the bank therefore needs to maintain a positive output gap by persistently pursuing powerful monetary easing under the framework of QQE with yield curve control. The bank there, thereby will encourage firms' wage and price setting stance to become more proactive and maintain positive momentum for a long time. Third, sluggishness in prices is, uh, is uh, attributable to a rising productivity that reflect uh, technological innovation in recent years, it is important to continuously examine how this will affect the natural rate of interest as well as economic and financial activities. The effects of new technologies on the economy are often difficult to grasp in an uh, accurate and timely manner uh, using existing statistics. Thus. Uh, they should be examined in detail from uh, various uh, perspectives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Ferreira. <laughs> I mean, you've all focused on wages uh, and wage growth, as a, which is understandable given that the challenges uh, are currently being faced. But I'm interested, Governor Corroda, if I could just come back to you briefly, that... Uh, Governor Lowe pointed out that even the 2% wage growth that they're seeing now mm. in uh, Australia was not enough to achieve the inflation target. Mm. How, how important is, is more wage inflation to you in hitting your target? What kind of wage inflation do you need to, to finally hit that mm. ja Japani Japanese inflation mm. target? Uh, the uh, Japanese government uh, has been uh, asking uh, uh, labor and business to uh, raise uh, 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 wages uh, in the last uh, five years. And uh, this year, government even uh, requested uh, labor and business to uh, agree to 3% wage increase uh, uh, during the so-called spring offensive. Uh, final result is not yet uh, uh, known, uh, but I presume uh, a total wage increase, including base pay, uh, as well as other uh, <coughs> uh, element of wages, uh, would have uh, risen uh, uh, close to 3%. As I said, uh, the Bank of Japan is aiming at achieving 2% inflation target or price stability target, uh, 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 while the labor productivity increase in Japan is around 1%. Uh, that means that at least 3% wage increase is necessary to be consistent with uh, 2% uh, uh, price stability target so that uh, the government uh, request uh, uh, for 3% wage increase uh, is quite, quite appropriate. By the way, uh, also the government has been raising the minimum wages by 3% almost every year. And again, this is uh, consistent with, uh, with our uh, price stability target. Mm. Governor Lowe, I'm interested in the context, the conversations that we had yesterday about whether or not central banks can really change people's expectations and the difficulty of talking to households uh, and really changing their way of thinking when they are often really not wanting to pay attention to you at all. 
when you're trying to, I mean, how do you think about your capacity to affect that wage growth? You say that's a major focus now. You know, is it harder to do that because we're more, we're, we're so concerned about talking to markets that we've become, it's harder for us to talk directly to households, as I, I think Charles uh, Whiplosh was saying yesterday. Yeah, I, I'm not trying to talk directly to households on this particular issue. I'm trying to talk to businesses. We've got the situation where we've got the central bank governor calling for higher wage growth, the political leaders on a centre-right government calling for higher wage growth, and senior members of the business community calling for higher wage growth. Yet it doesn't happen. And then when I talk to individual businesses, they kind of agree in principle the country would be better off having wage growth of three point something or two point something. But, but not in their, like being taught but, what to do, though. But not in their business. Yeah. <laughs> and the reason that it shouldn't happen in their business is they're so worried about competition. If kind of we, we in a market economy we we uh, we don't have the coordination mechanism to get to something which I think would be a better outcome, because no individual business wants to uh, put up its wages more uh, more quickly than its competitors. There's a first mover problem. So. The thing that I'm trying to do, and I don't know whether it's going to be effective, is to kind of help solve that coordination problem by saying, look, it's OK. It's OK to give wage increases of three points something. And if that can become the norm, I think we'll be better off. And I don't know whether it's going to be effective or not. Mm -hmm. I mean, Governor, uh, President Draghi, I'm sort of interested. I mean, the Eurozone experience of this is a little bit different. Uh, and I guess not just because the, the recovery is not as far along as the many, many years recovery uh, in Australia. You know, we've heard a lot in the last couple of days, and we just heard from Philip, there's something different about the wage bargaining process at the moment, and we're getting a lot of employment growth and not so much wage growth. And yet, if you look at the forecast for the Eurozone, it feels like we're not expecting such a transformation in the labour market outcomes, at least in many countries in the Eurozone, maybe in some we think the natural rate has fallen dramatically. How do you think about whether or not wage bargaining and the wage employment relationship has changed in the Eurozone? Well, it's a difficult question because we actually have 19 countries and each one of them has, uh, has a historical a setup of industrial relations and I don't think they can be easily compared. But you have to set monetary policy for all of them. That's right, exactly. But uh, and that, that's the, that's the, that's the challenge. But uh, but it's it's silly changed in a sense. You, as I was mentioning, one of the reasons in the list of uh, uh, of why is the um, the wages aren't responding as fast as we were used to uh, is the disappearance of trade unions. Now, in some countries, they were important to begin with, but in others, were not. So there is a combination of factors that has changed this relation. But the point I was making before is that, yes, that's true. That explains the past. Uh, we, we are convinced that the future looks uh, different, looks much more like we were used to see years ago when this relationship was stable and we were looking at that to uh, predict uh, the movement in wages from the labor market conditions. So, so by and large, you have a variety of factors. We think, uh, we are convinced they were very important in the past in explaining this low speed of adjustment. Now they are sort of washing out, they're less important. We see, for example, uh, that what was discussed in the first day of this conference, the residuals of our Phillips curve washing out, moving away. The relationship is increasingly uh, capturing uh, a rather traditional design. Now, of course, we, maybe well, we got to be careful here because uh, maybe we want to see absolutely want to see things that don't exist, and therefore we convince ourselves that they exist. Uh, but I, frankly, if I compare, for example, the uh, all the projections about future inflation that the ECB has produced over the last four or five years, you clearly see a greater convergence, you clearly see a narrowing down of the confidence intervals, you clearly see an upward trend in underlying inflation. For example, one thing that's telling is that over our projection horizon, the underlying inflation, now the core inflation is higher than headline inflation. So in our projections, we're actually discounting some slowdown in oil prices, but an underlying strength which remains through the 2020. So, I say, yes, I mean, it's a complex continent, 19 countries, very different, lots of reasons. Uh, they can explain the past. Not sure that this diversity is what can, is, is the best predictor of the future. We've been, 
you know, implicitly talking about as if we have many, hopefully, many more years of recovery to go and to discover what the, the dynamics of, of wages and prices will be. But, but we, we started the week uh, with quite a provocative speech from, from Larry Summers, who said that the world was now economically, politically, and socially less prepared for the next downturn than it's ever been. Chairman Powell, do you, do you agree with that? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, a couple of things we know are that um, interest rates have been lower. And they may, we don't know this, but they will probably remain low, which means we'll be closer to the zero lower <coughs> bound, which may mean that we're more likely to hit the zero lower bound. I think we've, we've taken that into um, consideration. I think there's still fiscal policy space in the United States. There's less than there used to be. There's less than there should be. But, uh, but there's some, some room to react. And um, I, think we, we, I think we kind of take all of that on board. And the, the real question is, and I, I guess Larry may have said something about this. I didn't pick that part up. But um, uh, you know, what's the right policy response to that? And, and you know, if you look at an economy in, in the case of the United States, which has growth well above trend, unemployment at 3.8%, Inflation moving up, uh, not quite at, at target, but getting close. And uh, the federal funds rate uh, still in a place that is accommodative in, in the view of, the, of members of the committee, perhaps 100 basis points below the median estimate of a neutral rate. So what that calls for in, in our thinking is continued gradual rate increases. And I guess one of the things that came through in, in, in Larry Summers' remarks, but also in other places, is that because we know that there is this reduced uh, monetary policy uh, capacity, uh, it, we, we expect there to be in the, in the coming uh, next time we have a downturn, you know, the relationship between fiscal and monetary policy becomes quite a lot more complicated in this environment where you have a lot more unconventional policy um, or potential for unconventional policies. And I mean, even now, uh, there's a potential for conflicts to develop between the fiscal objectives and the monetary objectives. I mean, Governor Correda, I wondered, you know, how you think about the interaction between fiscal and monetary policy mm. over the next few years in a, in a somewhat ab abstract way, but is it now more complicated than when we first designed mm. those independent central banks? And mm. um. Always uh, the cooperation between uh, fiscal authority and the central bank uh, by way of uh, policy uh, uh, coordination or, or uh, something like that uh, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, necessary, but at the same time, uh, the mandate of the central bank is basically uh, the price stability and uh, the financial system uh, stability. Of course, uh, some central banks like the Federal Reserve and the Reserve Bank of Australia have uh, uh, another mandate of uh, achieving uh, full employment or something like that. But uh, for the Bank of Japan, the mandate is basically price stability and the financial stability. And uh, we have to uh, continue to, uh, uh, to aim at uh, achieving and maintaining uh, price stability and the financial stability. And uh, in some cases, uh, that might uh, uh, make uh, uh, active or proactive fiscal policy uh, uh, somewhat difficult, <laughs> but uh, at this moment, uh, I don't see any uh, uh, difficulty uh, uh, of coordinating uh, fiscal policy and monetary policy uh, arising uh, uh, in the near future. I don't see but, any problem. Well, I, I guess mm. one example is if the government is now going to move to having a broad mm. uh, target for the budget deficit, oh, yeah, yeah. The government, which includes the debt interest, then that complicates yeah, yeah. things yeah, for you the, a The bit. government uh, is, uh, is aiming at achieving uh, primary surplus uh, by fiscal 2025, uh, and uh, also uh, 
trying to achieve uh, that uh, GDP ratio to gradually decline over, over time. And, uh, and I, I think that uh, uh, fiscal consolidation uh, program is, is quite appropriate for the Japanese economy uh, as well as uh, the public finance because uh, already uh, the Japanese government has accumulated uh, very large uh, uh, debt over the years and uh, it's uh, quite necessary for the government to uh, uh, consolidate the uh, fiscal position, uh, of course, uh, gradually in the medium to uh, long run. And that uh, is not uh, particularly uh, inconsistent with uh, our monetary policy in coming years. Um, I'm going to get on to, I can see these people thinking of their, their questions, which will be, which be much tougher than, than the mine, I'm sure. So I just had, but I had a, one more question for, for Chairman Powell. Uh, we had some discussion yesterday. I think you weren't here for it, but there was some discussion about how central banks should communicate to households and uh, whether perhaps we end up talking a lot to financial markets means that you're also talking in a very careful, as you all are today, very careful way that then makes it harder for you to speak sort of directly and straightforwardly to households. You said in, the, in a panel that, we were, that we, you participated in recently when we were both in, in Stockholm, you said you thought that maybe there would be less room for, less need for forward guidance in the future. I, I, I made me think when Charles Wiplos was saying you shouldn't be spoon feeding the markets. You know, do you want to say a little bit more about how you see forward guidance? Sure. Uh so uh, obviously we, we want the public and the markets to understand how we're thinking about the economy, how we're thinking about the path of policy or reaction function and that kind of thing. I think during the financial crisis, uh, in order to support the economy, we began to do quite explicit date-based and then state-based uh, forward guidance about the path of policy. And that was, that was a, you know, a, an unconventional tool that we came to rely upon. I think it worked. I think it did. Um, assure the public that w rates would remain lower and that sort of thing. So as we move back to a more normal environment in the United States, we're, we, we're going to have a shorter statement at the end of the meeting that won't have so much of the, in the way of formal forward guidance. We're still going to have uh, you know, the summary of economic projections, which puts a, a, quite a lot of uh, information about the individual projections of, of individual members of the committee. So that's really how we're thinking about forward guidance, how I am anyway. Okay. Um, so, maybe you'll take a group of questions from the audience and then, uh, yes, Ben Friedman. Uh, we wait for, we'll have these two here. Uh, okay, Lars Svensson, uh, Stockholm School of Economics. I have a question to uh, Philip Lowe. He was uh, nervous about the side effects of uh, lowering the policy rate and raising inflation to the inflation target. In, in Australia, uh, uh, nervous about the side effects of that. I, I would like to point out to another side effect of undershooting your inflation target. If you do that on a sustained basis, if, if you accept lower inflation on average than your inflation target, that is like having an implicit, inofficial, unofficial target below the official target. Once the market and the general public understands that, they will lower their inflation expectations. By the Fisher equation, that means that the average policy rate will then be correspondingly lower, and the gap to the effective lower bound will be shorter, smaller, and we will more likely hit uh, the effective lower bound in the future. Doesn't that make the economy less resilient mm. and more vulnerable? Isn't that a pretty important uh, side effect of undershooting your inflation target? Okay, I think we'll try and take a question you know, from Ben Friedman as well, and then. Ben Friedman from Harvard. Uh, my question is for any or all of our distinguished <laughs> uh, panelists. The overwhelming focus of discussion at this conference has been about how the 
flattening of the Phillips curve has made and is making it more difficult for our central banks to raise inflation up to their stated targets. I hope each of you has been thinking about the reverse of that proposition, which is that in the event, we hope unlikely, that something goes wrong and we wind up with inflation above our central bank's targets, then either because the central bank's policy is behind hand in uh, slowing the economies or something goes wrong with oil prices, there's of course the usual laundry list of things that could go wrong. Uh, the, flat, the same flattening of the Phillips curve we've been talking about would then make it more difficult for our central banks to reduce uh, to, re to reduce inflation back down to the targets. And in a world of dynamic strategy for policy, surely that uh, implication has some bearing on policy today. So I wonder whether our central banks have taken account of and are thinking about the, uh, the potential difficulty in which they would find themselves should inflation for some reason or other over the next some years uh, wind up uh, being in a situation in which not how do we get from one to two, but how do we get from three or something like that to two? We've got, we've got a cluster of questions in the same place. I promise I will ask questions from other parts as well. But if you, actually, there's a third question just here, actually, right next to us. Um, and then we'll, we'll go to the panel. So my question, uh, so I'm Stefan Garlick from EFG, so my question is also to Philip Lowe, and it's, it's along the line of Lars's uh, questions. So Philip, uh, you mentioned that the public may not care very much if inflation is 1% or, or if it's 2%, but anyone who has borrowed is going to care about what the actual inflation is. In particular, governments are going to care. So if they have, uh, I mean, they borrow under the assumption that the central bank will deliver on the inflation target. And if inflation ends up being unexpectedly low, exposed real interest rates end up being unexpectedly high. Now, that's not a problem if you have a public debt to GDP ratio of 40%, which I think is the Australian case. But it is a problem if the public debt to GDP ratio is 140%, uh, which is the case in some countries. Now, one can, of course, argue that this is just an example of poor fiscal policy, and the central bank should simply disregard this. But in practice, I mean, shouldn't the central bank worry about the public finance consequences of running unexpectedly low inflation? Thank you. Philip Lowe, do you want to answer uh, those, the, the couple of questions that were particularly related to you, but then I think others will probably have remarks? Yep, thank you. Well, I acknowledge the risks that um, both Lars and Stefan talk about, but in my mind, they're relatively marginal. Our fiscal policy Kind of, we've had dis disciplined fiscal policy for a long time, so we don't have a public debt issue at all. And I, I remain confident we're going to get back to 2.5%. It's just going to take us a bit of time. I accept that it's kind of going to be a gradual process, and uh, because it's gradual, people might lower their inflation expectations. But if we keep communicating that we're shooting for 25 and we're making gradual progress towards that, uh, I don't think we're going to see a, a persistent decline in inflation expectations. There is a risk that that happens. And balancing that risk against the risk that would come from pursuing a policy that pursued a more rapid return of inflation to 2.5%. And in the environment we've been in, I see the risks being quite large from trying to get inflation up more quickly. We've been one and three quarters to two. I think we can live with that for a while to try and get it back to two and a half very quickly, it would be mainly through people borrowing more money and having higher asset prices. I think that's a much bigger risk to our economy than uh, people having un uh, surprisingly low inflation expectations. We've got very high levels of debt, very high levels of asset prices, and I think that is, that, that's, a, that's our number one domestic risk, not lowering people having lower inflation expectations. We're trying to balance those two things off. Do you want to respond to the point about the, 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 flatter, the flip side of the flatter Phillips curve, a kind of infinite sacrifice ratio? 
<laughs> I guess I would, I would just briefly say that, so if we think that inflation is held in place by relatively strongly anchored inflation expectations, and we've seen years and years of inflation below that, the principal risk we've been worried about through these years is the pressure on, on, uh, on inflation expectations that they might move downward, which would be really bad in, in a, at a time when we think interest rates are gonna be low, it would be, mean even less room uh, for, for policy to respond. So that's been the thing we've been, uh, we've been worried about, N not, not uh, moving inflation up, but just really worried that we'd lose expectations. So, um, and I think as you get to a place where, as we're, we're getting close now to uh, on-target inflation, I think we're well aware that if you go, if, it, if expectations were to move above 2% meaningfully, then yes, it would be some work to get it back. But that, that project, uh, you know, we haven't really seen inflation expectations get up to 2% yet, or inflation itself. Do you, do you see any advantages to having inflation, when you've had a prolonged period below inflation, of having inflation then overshoot for some period of time? On this expectations question. You know, that's not the design of our, uh, our, our approach. We, we've said that we would be um, uh, concerned if inflation were to run persistently above or below 2%. Uh, and so we, we haven't said that we're shooting for or would like, would like an overshoot. That's not something we've said. Um, but but I, I think, you know, as I said in my remarks, it doesn't mean that we can stop thinking about resource uh, utilization. It really is just a question of keeping inflation expectations anchored at 2%. President Draghi. Uh, first to, to Lars, I mean, you, you all may guess that uh, we've been asked several times to revise our objective of inflation. And it depends on where you are located in Eurozone. Uh, you have some countries that have asked us to revise it downwards. People, I mean, just no countries, just no governments, but people, uh, saying, claiming that 2% was an outrageously high inflation. And countries that have such been, people in countries that have been suggesting that 2% was too low inflation. One of the reasons why we refuse to, there are many reasons why it would, be, it would have been unwise to revise our objective. But one, one of the reasons why we never revise the uh, downward, our objective was exactly what you said. We simply would uh, self-limit our policy space without any clear gain from any, uh, any point, from any angle. So there's, uh, there's no reason to do that. On, uh, on, the, on, on Ben's question, um, I, I think I'll say something very close to, to what Jay's just said. I think it's a high class problem. Uh, at this point in time. But we've asked ourselves, what, what if? Of course, I mean, if we, we are being questioned. We've been questioned so many times about the monetary policy being so unconventional, so expansionary, so accommodating, that we had to ask ourselves, what if? And the answer is that we have plenty of instruments to do that. We have plenty of instruments to go back and uh, certainly our deposit facility reserve is one that comes to mind immediately. Uh, the uh, rhythm of the reinvestment policy is another one that comes to mind. The third would be the interest rates in due time. So, but there is also another observation that um, came to mind while you were asking the question is, are we sure that the slope of the Phillips curve remains constant in an entirely new regime of inflation? where expectations are being adjusted to a permanently higher level of inflation? And uh, I'm not sure I would answer yes, because the, one, of the reasons, one, of the things that, one of the reasons why we find so difficult to disentangle different factors is exactly we aren't sure that's been stable all throughout the last 10 years, uh, the slope. I mean, that's the... That's the, uh, the other thing we look at, however, and that also uh, gives guidance to in responding to, to, to your question is, um, um, well, we have very different countries in the Eurozone. And they are different for a variety of reasons, one of which, however, is relevant to this discussion is uh, how advanced are they on the recovery path? What's their position in the business cycle? And the, ideally, what we would like to see is higher inflation for countries that are in different, higher, well, different inflation rates for countries that are in different positions in the business cycle. And we are seeing some of that, which is another encouraging sign that we are proceeding on a convergence path. But I'm interested when you say you have lots, plenty of uh, yeah. facilities, plenty of instruments. 
I mean, on most of the, it goes back to the point earlier, on most of the estimates of when we might have a recession, a lot of those instruments are not going to allow the kind of room that you had in response to the crisis. I mean, don't you think there will have to be more of a role for, for counter-cyclical fiscal policy in that environment? Oh, okay, no, but Ben was talking about the opposite problem, namely too high inflation. All right. Do you, no, no, you, 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 what, what do you do? But on the sacrifice. Again, what, what do we do if we have a recession? Well, frankly, even on our medium-term horizon projections, namely until 2020, we don't see a recession. We see, we see lower, poten lower growth, like, but, but nothing that resembles to a recession. So uh, the uh, question is sort of, should we actually ask ourselves what we would, what, not we, actually, not monetary policy, what others would do just in case of a recession. And uh, here again, it's very difficult to answer in a complex place like Eurozone. You, know, so you have countries that have fiscal space and countries that don't have fiscal space. And here comes a, a completely different set of considerations. How do, we, uh, how do we ensure that the Eurozone becomes gradually uh, somewhat resembling to an optimal currency area? How do we ensure that there is a collective convergence? And, uh, and here we are entering the, sort of the realm of uh, the uh, reform of the monetary union, the deepening of the monetary union. By the way, uh, on this front, uh, the recent document uh, produced by France and Germany is to be welcome. It's to be welcome because it's an encouraging step in this direction. And it's, and it's an important step made important by the very difficult political circumstances in which this document is being produced. And uh, so that is, uh, and it's also important, it's been made important because I think, if I'm not mistaken, it's the first time we are having a proposal by, by, by governments. So we had proposals by the commission, we had proposals in the famous five presidents report, but, the, but they were not uh, government's proposals. So in this sense, but we, we cannot, the bottom line of the answer I'm giving to you, we cannot disentangle what would be the policy response in front of a so far hypothetical big recession in the Euro area from the question of the reform of the deepening, what we call deepening of the monetary union. Do you, just quickly on the, what you said about the statement, because obviously that's a very timely thing to talk about. Is your interpretation of that agreement that it takes the Eurozone closer to having a greater ability to respond fiscally to a future crisis? It, uh, you see, your question can be answered in a variety of ways. <laughs> and some, of, some people would agree with, uh, with this uh, statement saying, yes, we need a stabilization capacity. Others would not. The important thing that I would draw from this recent development is that uh, not necessarily a specific instrument is being designed, presented, and defined, but it's, a, it's an approach. It's a, it's a sense that in the future, we have to work to deepen the monetary union. Whether this instrument is exactly what you are suggesting, a stabilization budget, or it is an unemployment insurance scheme, like it's being suggested, uh, hinted at least in the, in, the, in the document. By the way, we shouldn't, I mean, the document is vague, as you've seen, so much work will be needed on that. Uh, it's it's going to be determined. The important thing, in my view, is that for the first time, uh, after discussing for several years the deepening of the monetary union, now finally we have something we can work on. And this something doesn't come from uh, five presidents of uh, individuals, but it comes from governments, from, from the German or French government. I think you've definitely just been interesting, but uh, we'll leave it to <laughs> others to judge. Um, yes, over there. there. I can't see you. Mario Marcella uh, from the Central Bank of Chile. Um, President Draghi made a reference uh, to underlying inflation and, uh, and core inflation. And it uh, seems odd to me that we have been discussing price dynamics over a couple of days, and very little reference has been made uh, to core and underlying inflation, which is quoted by central banks very often in, in, uh, <clears throat> in, setting, in justifying their decisions. 
So maybe one reason for that is that uh, uh, the most common measure of uh, core inflation that we have, which is excluding uh, food and fuels, uh, may be too crude as a, as a measure of uh, core inflation. So I wonder how much of what uh, we have discussed uh, these days about, uh, uh, you know, about uh, building alternative uh, uh, price uh, inflation indicators may be already uh, integrated into the kind of analysis that uh, central, central banks uh, make, particularly President Draghi has made reference on, on a number of calculations that are made by, by the ECB. And, uh, uh, and a second question is that uh, we have uh, discussed a number of uh, factors that may be uh, pushing inflation down, some of uh, which look like a one-off, but uh, given that there may be a number of those, uh, uh, their effect may be more lasting. But I wonder uh, of uh, how would you react to another one-off change in prices, which is raising import tariffs. How would you look at that in terms of uh, measured <laughs> inflation and, uh, and the response of uh, monetary policy? Okay, uh, Krishna, I think you had, do you have a question? Just wait for the mic. Thank you. So um, in the past week just gone, we saw the Federal Reserve retire uh, forward guidance that had been in the statement for a long time, and we saw the ECB introduce a new form of forward guidance. So I wanted just to take the opportunity to invite uh, both the chairman and the president uh, to comment on what they think we've learned about forward guidance, specifically when is it appropriate to use forward guidance and at what point in the policy cycle does it become, if at all, inappropriate to provide this forward guidance? So there was a question about the price setting that happens from tariff setting. Um, I guess the broader question coming out of things like even the retaliation that we had announced today from the European Union is, you know, when does this trade issue become a real start to have a meaningful impact on your assessment of the strength of the global recovery and potentially uh, monetary policy going forward. Chairman Powell. Okay, so that's your question for me. <laughs> well, no, it's the question. He, it's, it's the mention, question. There was a mention of trade. I, the, uh, I, I was just clarifying. questions, if you want. And sure. you take the forward guidance, because after all, you lifted it. We don't. So <laughs> uh, the... Um, uh, it, frankly, we haven't, what is uh, about tariffs, what is being projected in, our, uh, in, our, in the last set of projections are the tariffs that have been implemented already, which are not, uh, are not very, uh, are not, don't have a very significant effect uh, either on uh, output or on prices. A completely different uh, analysis uh, would probably be, and uh, but we haven't done it yet, uh, when we will consider the uh, tariffs that have been implement announced or implemented since then, uh, first. Second, the, uh, it, it's not easy, but I think at some point we'll have to figure out uh, kind of uh, what is the potential, of, what is the round of retaliation effects that's going to take place. And what is the effect, and that's probably the most important thing, what's the effect on confidence? And therefore, what's the effect on uh, business investment? What's the effect on uh, experts? What's the effect on consumers' confidence? Uh, we think there have been lessons that one can learn from the past. And, uh, and they're, all, uh, they're, all, uh, they're all very negative. So it's, um, it's not, um, it's not uh, easy and it's not yet the time, in a sense, to see what the consequence of monetary policy of all this can be. Um, but there's no reason, there's no ground to, uh, be, to be optimistic on that. The, um, on underlying inflation, oh, I'm sorry, uh, okay, uh, why don't you answer the other question, then I'll answer the underlying <laughs> inflation. On, on trade. Yeah, so first, I'm obviously not going to comment on any particular trade policy, but uh, um, in principle, changes in trade policy could, uh, could uh, cause us to have to uh, question the outlook. 
Um, so uh, we, we have a very wide, <coughs> wide range of contacts in the business world in the United States and around the world. And as we talk to them, uh, they uh, continually and increasingly express concern over uh, trade developments. We talk about that in the Beige Book, and then, and then the Reserve Bank presidents talk about it in the, uh, in the FOMC meeting, and, and we talk about it then in the minutes. And um, I'd say as I, the, those concerns seem to be rising. For the first time, we're hearing uh, about uh, decisions to postpone investment, postpone hiring, postpone making decisions. That's a new thing. Uh, if you ask, is it, in the, uh, is it in the forecast yet, is it in the outlook, the answer is no. Uh, and um, you, you don't see it in the, in the performance of the economy, and we don't have any way to, uh, to know how to put it in, into, the, into the outlook just yet. So that's where that is. Before we get onto the, the forward guidance, I'm sort of interested in what uh, Governor Corroda and, mm -hmm. and, and uh, Governor Lowe have to say <laughs> on the trade point, because there's a perception that mm -hmm. the countries that are more uh, involved with, with China mm -hmm. um, will have uh, less, will have some protection from this. Yeah. I mean, uh, <clears throat> rather than a direct impact uh, uh, on the Japanese economy, the indirect impact on the Japanese economy could be uh, quite significant. If this uh, escalation of tariff uh, by US and China continues and, 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 uh, and uh, actually implemented, that would uh, significantly affect uh, East Asia supply chain uh, centering uh, China, Korea, Japan, Taiwan, as well as uh, Southeast Asian economies. So uh, I really hope that uh, this escalation could be uh, 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 rescinded and, and, uh, and uh, normal sort of uh, trading uh, relationship between the US and China would prevail. Uh, so this is... Uh, a matter of uh, great concern for, for, for Japan. By the way, I just would like to make one comment on Professor Friedman's <laughs> question, quite interesting question. Although, uh, I mean, if really uh, inflation rates suddenly uh, accelerate towards three or four percent, by what factor? If uh, it is uh, through uh, uh, external factors like uh, sudden uh, currency depreciation or sudden oil price rise, uh, they would have only temporary impact unless uh, exchange rate continue to depreciate or oil prices continue to rise. So these are temporary factors, so I don't think uh, this would raise a serious problem. Uh, sudden uh, rise in inflation expectations, that is extremely unlikely. And then uh, you would uh, find that, uh, after all, the Phillips curve uh, was not so flat. Phillips curve uh, became steeper so that uh, with uh, uh, tight labor market, the wages and prices uh, started to rise, uh, inflation accelerate, and so on. So. Then, of course, uh, you can use uh, steeper uh, Phillips curve to contain your inflation. Governor Lowe, did you, have, did you want to respond on... Uh, well, on, on trade, I think what's happening is incredibly disturbing. Uh, can any of us think of a country that's made itself wealthier mm. and boosted productivity growth by building walls? Mm. Probably not. I can think of a lot of countries that have made themselves wealthier and more prosperous by reducing walls to people, capital and goods and services, and my country would probably be a, kind of the poster child there. So I view what happen is happening is, is, is incredibly worrying. There are the, the tariffs themselves, I don't think, kind of are, are going to derail the glo global expansion, but I can think of two mechanisms where that expansion could be derailed. The first is through financial markets, because they're very good at telescoping future events to today. 
to do, so far the financial markets have taken a relatively kind of benign interpretation, but that could change very quickly, and so we could see a lot of turbulence as people bring those for, future events forward to today. And the other mechanism is that businesses, uh, uh, the, the option value of waiting goes up a lot in kind of what Jay was saying, kind of people starting to delay decisions, and in Canada that's happening, in Mexico it's happening, I find it disturbing that it's happening in the United States, it's probably happening in China, I know it's happening in parts of Southeast Asia. So the option value of waiting is very high at the moment, and it wouldn't take that much for, fin for financial markets to, to kind of combine with businesses who are waiting to turn this into a really big global event. So I'm I hope it has a low probability, but I'm very disturbed at what hap what's happening, and it's, and it's very worrying. And so on a, on a much smaller issue, on underlying inflation, I agree uh, with Mario about the importance of looking at underlying inflation, and much of our public communication is around measures of underlying inflation, not the exclusion-based ones where you exclude food and energy, but we put a lot of weight on the trimmed mean measure of inflation and the weighted median, and much of our public communication is focused on those two measures. President Trang, you said you just wanted to... Yeah, on the, uh, still on trade and on discussion tariffs, there is a more general aspect of what's happening that it's, in a sense, if, if possible, would be even more worrisome. Um, and that is the, um, I would say, the desire for uh, um, unilateral action that uh, has uh, caught several countries, not only the United States, yes, we're talking about that in, in the context of tariffs, but there are other examples of unilateral action that basically undermines the multilateral framework in which I believe all of us have grew up. And uh, so the potential changes that this may start are something that is unknown, uh, it's very worrisome, and uh, I, again, I cannot see any positive side to that. So are a source of considerable, let, let me use the word that we use with markets, not with people, uncertainty. And there was a question about forward guidance, sure, the so. lessons of forward guidance. <laughs> yeah. So um, fundamentally, uh, as we all know here, even on a good day, there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty about uh, the path of the economy and, and hence the path of policy. And so uh, to be providing a lot of forward guidance all the time is to risk uh, under communicating about that uncertainty. And I think that's a real risk for us is to, to, that we say things and they're often taken as forecasts or even promises and they're really not. So I think in the ordinary course, we should, we should uh, be very careful to communicate as clearly as possible about the level of uncertainty that we have. And I think explicit forward guidance kind of cuts against that. So, but in, in a situation where the central bank needs to correct uh, the public's misperception of the path of rates or needs to provide more accommodation and perhaps is close to the zero lower bound. I think that um, forward guidance is a very close in product extension to, to just regular rate policy. It, it doesn't have political economy issues with it. It's, a, it's sort of a commitment technology in a way, even though you probably will wind up saying that it's not a commitment, but the public we know will, will take it as such to some extent. So, and I think it works. I think the record in the crisis was that it did uh, reduce uncertainty about the path of policy and even, uh, and even push down expectations about the path of policy. So a relatively close-in product extension that uh, I, would, I would think uh, could well be used in the future when needed, but shouldn't be used in, in the ordinary course. I think we've got time for like, one or two more. Eric. Um. Eric Nielsen from Unicredit. Uh, Chairman Powell, last autumn in Washington, you gave a very good speech uh, predicting that the Fed could normalize rates without having any, any negative impact, material impact on, on emerging markets. Since then, uh, a few things has happened. You got a big fiscal expansion that sucks up a lot of savings from around the world. You started to reduce your balance sheet and you become chairman. <laughs> and, um, and then we have had a, a bit of wobbles in emerging markets. I, I don't think anybody thinks it's systemic, but it's, but it's certainly sort of out there. So I wonder whether you would, would sort of uh, expand a little bit on whether you are as confident in, uh, in what you said at the IAF conference in Washington today, or whether there is a bit out there that worries you a bit more. Uh, your own curve has flattened a lot, which is, from us in the market, something we kind of look at and wonder whether that's a, 
a forewarning or something more serious. I'm not sure we have, was there another question? No, I think that will be our. Uh, okay, well, uh, so on emerging markets, um, I should start by saying that uh, emerging market economies now amount to more than half of economic activity and well more than half of the growth. So they're quite important and important to us. And, and uh, you know, the fact that they, that the, having them remain strong is, is quite important to our own growth. So we, we recognize and appreciate that. We also understand that in a world of global capital markets and integrated capital markets and integrated value chains and, and economies, um, the things that we do will have spillovers into other through financial conditions into other economies, and by the way, vice versa, of course. It's as you've seen over the last couple of years. So, you know, we tried to, we understand that, and uh, we know particularly that open economy, smaller open economies in particular, can receive uh, flows at times which are, which make, make life difficult, make, uh, it can be a difficult challenge for them to manage. So, what do we control about that? We, we control, one thing we control is to try to communicate as clearly as possible about how we see our economy and how we see the path of policy, how we would react to changes in, in either of those things. So, and I think over the last couple of years, if you look back at uh, over the last two years, where we are today is, is pretty consistent with what we've been saying, where we thought we would be now and the way we thought we would react. So that we do control. And we'll obviously we'll continue to try very hard to, um, uh, you know, to carry out our mandate and and to avoid surprises wherever possible. Well, um, well, thank you very much. I can't help uh, wondering whether uh, we will still be saying the same things in a few years' time. We'd still be wondering uh, why wage growth is not stronger and uh, what is the natural rate of unemployment. As uh, the president was pointing out earlier, it's... Uh, Many of these issues have been discussed for decades, but potentially not by uh, four central bank governors uh, of such important economies. So thank you very much to all of you, and thanks for all the questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm.